Wow, there are a lot of you out there. Uh, uh, thanks, Jessica, for that introduction, and I'll, I'll try to live up to it. And uh, thanks to the Humanities Center, the Simpson Center uh, for the Humanities, for organizing tonight's event, uh, particularly Kathy Woodward and, and Rachel Arteaga. Uh, also, thanks to the Executive Board of the Humanities Center for selecting me for this honor. Uh, and again, thanks to Paul Atkins for nominating me. And while I'm in a thanking mood, I'm going to say thanks to all of you uh, for coming tonight. Uh, there are many things you could be doing on a Thursday night. There are many demands on your time. And it's really extraordinary that so many of you are here to hear about poetry. I mean, to me, poetry is the undying art. It's something that I think about every day, uh, most every hour. Uh, and it's always uh, just deeply moving when I see that this, this passion of mine is shared by others. Uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> pull back uh, and on to tonight's talk. Uh, the, ti the, the title is Poets, or no, I've got to read my own screen. <laughs> Sing along, uh, Poets and Birds. This talk is dedicated to the memory of Charles Harold Christenau. Hark, hark, the lark at heaven's gate sings. Poets and songbirds. It's an association that, if it isn't universal, it is certainly remarkably persistent across linguistic lines and national lines and through the centuries. And uh, poets seem to be endlessly fascinated by this other form of life that is also dedicated to the creation of artfully patterned sound for the purposes of communication. And poets aren't unique in this. You can also say the same about composers and musicians. But with poets, there's something about the fact that they use words in their songs and birds do not that makes it into a perpetual exercise in compare contrast, uh, makes it into a fascination that ends up also being uh, an inquiry into what is communication, what are words good for, or what are they not good for? And uh, poets have taken this in a lot of different directions. Sometimes poets share with their readers the emotions that birdsong uh, provokes in them. An example is John Milton's 17th century lyric, L'Allegro, in which he says that one experiences mirth and delight when hearing the lark begin his flight and singing startle the dull night from his watchtower in the skies till the dappled dawn does rise. Other poets have concentrated on how birdsong seems to reveal to us the interior life of the bird itself, as the classical Greek poet Sappho does in her fragment 136, where she attributes to a nightingale a voice of longing. At times, poets have been simply, have marveled at the fact that uh, birdsong points to something that may not be said in words that could be ineffable, transcendent, or even sacred, as in this haiku by the 18th century Japanese poet Kobayashi Isa. Only birds sing the music of heaven in the world. Other times, poets have uh, aspired to be like birds, to have their words reach beyond words, to reach to the transcendental. This is frequent in the poetry of the medieval Persian writer Rumi, uh, particularly in his love poetry, which also usually has a mystical tinge. When the heart has seen the sweetheart, how can it remain bitter? When a nightingale has seen the rose, how can it keep from singing? Finally, poets have on occasion followed birds outside of language altogether. They have sung along with the birds. Here's an example from John Clare, a 19th century British poet from his poem, The Progress of Rhyme, where he has a nightingale sing. Choo-choo, choo-choo, and higher still. Choo-choo, choo-choo, more loud and shrill. Cheer up, cheer up, cheer up, and dropped low. Tweet, tweet, jug, jug, jug and stopped one moment just to drink the sound her music made. Now, because this is about singing along, here is a nightingale singing. You too can compare and contrast what you can do in writing and what you can't.
So, why am I here tonight to talk about poets and birds? Well, <laughs> good question. Uh, <laughs> It's because poets have so persistently written about birds, have so persistently sung along with them around the world, that it creates a kind of global archive of experience and wisdom that I believe one can bring to bear on what is in fact <laughs> one of the most pressing global predicaments of the present era. We all know about it. The world we live in is imperiled. The seas are rising, the ice caps are melting, deserts are growing, uh, storms and droughts are increasing in frequency and severity. All this is brought about by air pollution. And then there are all the other forms of human waste from sewage to the products of nuclear fission that are rendering entire sectors of this planet uninhabitable. This is a big problem and we have to do something about it. One can of course start from the position of economics or politics, but humanists have also argued that what we need to do is have people change their behavior which is really difficult to do, and how can you? One way is to encourage a new and different set of values. Uh, one can arrive at a new ethics, one of care, reciprocity, and involvement with all of the other species in the planet, because after all, we are in this together. The thinker and scholar Donna Haraway has written that uh, one place that we could begin working towards a new ethics is in the moment of interspecies encounter. She believes that when humans and animals come face to face uh, in a kind of genuine open-ended fashion, that what happens is that they hold in regard, they begin to respond to one another, they look back reciprocally. And what she says begins to happen is they enter the world of becoming with that is no longer are you human uh, for your own purposes, but you are together with this non-human other. And that the result is who and what are, these very basic coordinates for living, become newly at stake. That is, things like reason and language that humans have always prided themselves on are put into new question. Uh, you know, when you are playing around with your cat, you begin to wonder if it may not have language, but it can certainly communicate. So what are the limits and boundaries of the human? What matter? How can we meet our animal others in a looking reciprocally? This can be very abstract, and this is one of the reasons we need poetry. The literary critic Mark Payne has argued that poetry provides an exemplary instance of the power of the imagination. The willed exercise of the imagination, he writes, can enable poets through sustained effort to experience an animal's life as a life. That is, one begins to appreciate that an animal has its own biography. It has its own perspective on the world. It has its own needs, wants, and priorities. And humans may not be particularly part of that uh, range of priorities. And if poetry is a place where one can learn about interspecies encounter, I would say that it does provide us with a global corpus of bird poems that can help us begin to found that new ethics that can lead toward a better future. It can help us learn to stop fouling our own nest. Of course, no one talk can contain the world. It'd be folly to try to do so. And in what follows, I'm gonna be drawing my examples primarily from that body of literature I know best, 19th and 20th century American poetry. But I, looking around this room, I see lots of colleagues who can be up here tonight giving this lecture uh, and talking about Japanese poetry, Latin American poetry, Greek poetry. They could come at it from different angles, very knowledgeably, say in relation to the history of the environmental movement. Uh, people could talk about it in relation to indigenous folkways and epistemologies. No one talk can contain the whole of the world, but it can open the door on one. And a university can be a place where you explore it. Poetry as an archive of interspecies encounter. That sounds really stilted and abstract, but that's what I'm going to try to hope to show you, is that American poets can teach us about what it is to respect an animal. And I'm going to begin with one of the most famous bird poems in the American literary canon. It is by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and it is titled Sympathy. 
And as you listen to this, uh, my reading of this poem, uh, remember that Dunbar is an African-American poet. Uh, it's the late 19th century. This poem was published in 1899. He grew up in the era of reconstruction following the Civil War. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Sympathy. I know what the caged bird feels, alas, when the sun is bright on the upland slopes, when the wind stirs soft through the springing grass, and the river flows like a stream of glass, when the first bird sings and the first bud opes, and the faint perfume from its chalice <laughs> steals, I know what the caged bird feels. I know why the caged bird beats his wing till its blood is red on the cruel bars. For he must fly back to his perch and cling when he fain would be on the bough a swing. And a pain still throbs in the old, old scars and they pulse again with a keener sting. I know why he beats his wing. I know why the caged bird sings on me when his wing is bruised and his bosom sore, when he beats his bars and he would be free. It is not a carol of joy or glee, but a prayer that he sends from his heart's deep core, but a plea that upward to heaven he flings. I know why the caged bird sings. Sympathy, like many poems, doesn't progress uh, according to a narrative. It's not telling a story precisely. And it's not making an argument that you can follow in an ABC sort of linear fashion. What it does is it takes a idea, a proposition, in this case, the comparison, the poet is like a caged bird, and it tests different ways of talking about that to see which of them is truest, which of them finally gets to where the poet is wanting to go. And in this case, Dunbar begins with feeling what the bird feels. And what the bird feels is this desire to be out in the spring uh, weather, in the woods, to, to do what the bird wants to do naturally and spontaneously. And that's what it's blocked from doing. Okay. That's a good start, but it's not really what Dunbar is trying to get at. That's why you have a second and later a third stanza. And in the second stanza, the focus is not on the world out there. It's on the inside of the cage. More specifically, sympathy is now visceral, embodied, the experience of that bird as it tries to escape, the blood that the bird sheds, the newly uh, hurting wounds from earlier. Uh, and that, that begins to get at what Dunbar believes is the ground of sympathy, our shared flesh and the experience of imprisonment. And in the final stanza, uh, he revises this yet again. He also mentions bruises and soreness. Uh, but what really he's driving at is that song, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. And that song might be one of glee, sound like one of joy or glee, but that's not what it is. It's founded from, originates in extreme physical and emotional suffering. And it becomes a prayer, a plea for intercession. Uh, these, of course, are uh, common themes in African-American <coughs> literature, uh, the sorrow songs, the blues that song originates in historical pain and suffering. Uh, but this is also, it seems to me, a terrifically important iteration and version of that because it is foregrounding the relationship between humans and animals. Now, again, late 19th century, many of Dunbar's white readers would still have subscribed to the kinds of slavery era ideologies that said that black people were subhuman or inhuman, bestial or animal. These are the kinds of things you tell yourself in order to justify enslaving another person. And we have a bird beating itself bloody against a cage. Dunbar is taking this binary of human and animal and reinventing it, locating sympathy, connection between human and animal, in some ways troubling or erasing that boundary, and then putting it into a poem that circulates for the general reader modeling what it is to have true sympathy. It is not to maintain boundaries about what is human and what is not, but rather it is to embrace the whole of life. This is one of the ways that a poet can begin to teach us about interspecies encounter. It can help us rethink why we have an investment in saying humans are this, humans are that. Because every time we begin to make those assertions, what poets like Dunbar are telling us 
is we're giving the lie to sympathy, our instinctive connection to the animals, people, and others on this planet. Okay, I'm gonna move on to a different poem. It's also a 19th century poem. It's a good pendant one for Dunbar. And it's by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who was the most popular poet in the 19th century in this country. And it's a poem that also ends up being about shared flesh with animals, but it takes it in a different direction. And the sacred enters uh, quite prominently. Okay, this is Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Birds of Passage from 1858. Black shadows fall from the lindens tall that lift aloft their massive wall against the southern sky. And from the realms of the shadowy elms, a tide like darkness overwhelms the fields that round us lie. But the night is fair, and everywhere a warm, soft vapor fills the air, and distant sounds seem near. And above, in the light of the starlit night, swift birds of passage wing their flight through the dewy atmosphere. I hear the beat of their pinions fleet, as from the land of snow and sleet they seek a southern lee. I hear the cry of their voices high, falling dreamily through the sky, but their forms I cannot see. Oh, say not so. Those sounds that flow in murmurs of delight and woe come not from wings of birds. They are the throngs of the poet's songs, Murmurs of pleasures and pains and wrongs, the sound of winged words. This is the cry of souls that high on toiling, beating pinions fly, seeking a warmer clime. From their distant flight through realms of light, it falls into our world of night with the murmuring sound of rhyme. So Dunbar's poem is vivid, but not necessarily particularized. We don't know what kind of bird there is in that cage. Uh, he leaves that open to the reader to uh, imagine. Here, Longfellow uh, is more particular, uh, a bit more of an ornithologist, if you will. Uh, he locates you in a particular place, in a field facing the southern sky. There's lindens, there's elms, it's night. He goes on to talk about the actual the humidity in the air, the soft vapor. That's not very common in poetry. You don't usually get humidity. Uh, and then you get this, the, and the curious feature of this atmosphere is you can hear things that are far away as if it's close by. Uh, the, uh, and what happens then is you hear these swift birds of passage. You, can, you can't see them, it's night, but you can hear them. And this is uh, a, f a fact. Uh, many songbirds migrate at night. And one of the reasons is that Predators can't see them. It's a protective strategy. It also, in, at nighttime, there aren't thermals. The air isn't heating the ground and the air is not rising. So large birds like raptors aren't able to get up above the flocks and see them and dive down into them. So migration at night is a protective strategy. And Longfellow is noting this. Uh, these are birds that are migrating. So he, he has a sense of why they're there. So okay, that's, he sets the scene and then you get him saying what he is experiencing. I hear, I hear, but I cannot see. And this is uh, a little bit like Dunbar, you're gonna get three iterations. This is the first one, the more empirical one. This is what I see and he what I can't see and what I hear are these birds. But then he pulls back and, it, and the, the, the sound of these birds without being able to see them sends his mind spinning and the imagination begins. And he says, wait, no, they're not birds. Wait, I hear these, these sounds, it's just like poems. And, and he thinks of himself as a poet singing out, sending out winged words for listeners because, you know, if you pick up a book, you don't see the poet. It's like winged words flying around. So he becomes terribly excited. This moment is one where I recognize myself. I identify with this moment. Not birds. But that's, of course, ridiculous. Uh, and, and he knows it. So he comes back and does a kind of synthesis to those two things. It's birds. No. It's poets. No. It's everybody. This is the cry of souls that high on toiling, beating pinions fly. Uh, you know, angels, spirits. And now what he's imagining is that these migrating birds are a way of talking about, and this is a very traditional Christian metaphor, that they are undergoing the pilgrimage of life, and they are now headed to the realms of light, the afterlife. And that what happens as these spirits are moving out of the world is the sounds that they leave in their wake intimate to us what that world of light is like. 
because, as it says in Second Corinthians, now uh, uh, you know, it's the, the, the look through the glass darkly moment. Now through a glass darkly, then face to face. We're in the dark world. We can't have true revelation, but we can get intimations of it via rhyme, via song. So it's a Christian homiletic ending to the poem. But notice that it also identifies these birds. It still mentions wings. There's a blurring here between human and bird. It is not Orthodox Christian to attribute birds with souls. What does it mean to begin to attribute animals with souls? That entirely switches up how you treat them. Because if you're worried about the immortal soul of the bird that's singing, that entirely shifts what you're going to, how you're going to behave to that bird. So again, in poems, one has moments of interspecies encounter that can serve as the beginning of a new ethics. Okay, I'm gonna move on to a poem that uh, has an, a more particular encounter with a bird. In fact, we know which kind of bird in this case, uh, and it is a northern mockingbird. This poem is Walt Whitman's Out of the Cradle, Endlessly Rocking. I'm going to read a part of it. It's a much longer poem, uh, but it's a poem where uh, Whitman is recalling as a child uh, a moment of listening to birdsong and how important and transformative that was for him. Once Palmonic, when the lilac scent was in the air and fifth month grass was growing, up this seashore in some briars, two feathered guests from Alabama, two together, and their nest and four light green eggs spotted with brown. And every day the he-bird to and fro near at hand, and every day the she-bird crouched on her nest silent with bright eyes. And every day I, a curious boy, never too close, never disturbing them, cautiously peering, absorbing, translating. Shine, shine, shine. Pour down your warmth, great sun. While we bask, we two together. Two together. Winds blow south or winds blow north. Day come white or night come black. Home or rivers and mountains from home. Singing all time. Minding no time. While we two keep together. Till of a sudden, maybe killed, unknown to her mate, one forenoon the shebird crouched not on the nest, nor returned that afternoon, nor the next, nor ever appeared again. And thenceforward, all summer in the sound of the sea, and at night under the full of the moon in calmer weather, over the hoarse surging of the sea, or flitting from briar to briar by day, I saw. I heard at intervals the remaining one, the he-bird, the solitary guest from Alabama. Blow, 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 blow up sea winds along Palmonic's shore. I wait and I wait till you blow my mate to me. Yes, when the stars glistened, all night long on the prong of a moss-scalloped stake, down almost amid the slapping waves, sat the lone singer, wonderful, causing tears. He called on his mate. He poured forth the meanings which I, of all men, know. I have treasured every note, for more than once dimly down to the beach gliding, silent, avoiding the moonbeams, blending myself with the shadows, I, with bare feet, a child, the wind wafting my hair, listened long and long. Demon or bird, said the boy's soul, it is indeed towards your mate you sing, or is it really to me? For I, that was a child, my tongue's use sleeping. Now I have heard you. Now in a moment I know what I am for. I awake, and already a thousand singers, a thousand songs, a thousand warbling echoes have started to life within me, never to die. So, 
a moment of specific encounter, very specific, in the life of both poet and bird. And I would draw your attention to Whitman's use of the word here, translating. It's very odd. We don't normally think of translating noises that an animal makes. But in this case, what Whitman is doing is, through an act of the imagination, uh, precisely as Mark Payne describes it, intuiting and putting into words what he believes that song to mean. I mean, it's, it's, it's extraordinary, and it's in italics in the original. And elsewhere in the poem, he calls this uh, an aria. So he thinks of it as, uh, by analogy to opera. And notice it begins with the physical. Shine sun, we bask, that, that, that these birds are delighting in the moment. Uh, but then it becomes opened out to this kind of endless now of perfect companionship. We two birds, doesn't matter what time it is, singing all time, minding no time. That moment where you're, uh, the endless moment of celebration, a lack of self-consciousness, lack of self-awareness. This is one thing that poets have often been drawn to in birds, uh, is the sense that they sing without reference to past or future, this moment uh, of the now. But then there is this moment of history. One of the two birds doesn't come back, presumably dies. And then you have this next moment of translation. Now, this is an excerpt. It's, it goes on for much longer in the original, uh, where you have now the solitary singer. And that this is what really is transformative for young Whitman. It's, the first song was impressive, but the reason this becomes the heart of the poem is this strange scene where he says, are you singing towards your mate or are you singing to me? This moment of surprise of trying to figure out who is the audience here. It replays what one can call the primal lyric scene. John Stuart Mill also in the 19th century talks about how all lyric poetry is not heard but overheard. That there is somebody singing or speaking and us as readers of the poem are overhearing it. And that what you have is the solitary singer engaged in a solitary act that becomes communal via this eavesdropping reader. Whitman is encountering that primal scene of the lyric moment. His first poet is a bird. And that then that song, this translation of the song, becomes for him the starting point of his whole career. And you get those endless warbling echoes, the thousand songs. So this is an interpersonal encounter that is impactful and generative. It leads to more poetry. And so one can interact with animals in a way that, as he puts it, is full of meaning, which is exactly what we don't normally attribute to birdsong is meaning. It's a fantastic poem. I, I really recommend reading it if you haven't. Uh, but it does have one little problem. How does he actually know what the bird is thinking? It can just be projection. You know, If I were this bird, this is what I would be feeling. And that's why I'd like to turn directly from Whitman, one of the towering geniuses of 19th century American poetry, to the second towering genius, Emily Dickinson. Because almost always after reading Whitman, you need a good dose of Dickinson. <laughs> and uh, it's because Dickinson is a lot more careful uh, and weighed in how she uses language. Whitman is expansive. He throws it all out there. Dickinson has a very different sensibility. And we're going to uh, look at a poem of hers about a Baltimore Oriole. <laughs> Emily Dickinson, to hear an Oriole sing from 1862. To hear an oriole sing may be a common thing or only a divine. It is not of the bird who sings the same unheard as unto a crowd. The fashion of the ear attireth that it hear in dun or fair. So whether it be rune or whether it be none is of within. The tune is in the tree. The skeptic showeth me, no, sir, in thee. It can be difficult to 
follow her train of thought here. Dickinson is swift moving uh, as she mo goes from word to word, stanza to stanza, and her choices of diction are so unexpected. Uh, and her syntax can be very compressed and jagged. So let's go back through the poem so you get a sense of what, what, she's, what she's talking about. She begins with uh, this proposition, to hear an oriole sing may be a common thing or only a divine. Uh, only is a typical Dickinsonian ironic aside, as if the sacred and the divine can just be merely or only, as opposed to really important. So leaving aside the only, which is typical Dickinson turning the screw multiple times, She's giving you a choice. To hear an oriole can be an everyday thing. You know, you're just walking to work and you hear a bird, or it can be a revelation. What makes it, what, what's the difference? So then she says, it is not of the bird, that is, it's not the bird who's the one that's making the difference between commonplace and spectacular. The bird sings the same, whether people don't hear the bird or whether there's a lot of people listening to the bird. And it's true. Uh, the Oriole may be calling for a mate. The Oriole may be announcing its territory. It certainly doesn't care whether you, when you hear it, think it is a symbol of the divine. And so then she, as poets do, proposes a metaphor for what happens when you're listening to a bird. The fashion of the ear attireth that it hear. That is, it is the ear's fashion, although fashion is already introducing the kind of textile and clothing metaphor. The fashion of the ear attireth, and in that there is that which. So it is the ear that clothes what it is hearing in dun or fair. Dun means beige. So commonplace, boring clothes or fancy and fair clothes. It's the ear that's responsible. That is the ear of the person listening. It's not the bird itself. So whether it be rune or whether it be none is of within. And by rune, she has in mind the Scandinavian runes, the carved runes. It becomes a way to, to say something mysterious and deeply symbolic. You know, poems as runes. You could have a book titled something like that. The idea that you approach this mysterious thing and you interpret it deeply. So it could be that. Or it could be nothing. It is of within. It's the inside of the person listening that determines what the bird song means, not the bird. And then you get that last little exchange. Somebody says, the tune is in the tree. The skeptic show with me, nah, no sir, in thee. And the key there is that the word tune is used. Tune, of course, is music. And of course, birds have no concept of music or tune or song. These are human words, human concepts. That's, that's not the bird's life world uh, is music. Uh, and so what Dickinson is trying to get at in this poem is to say that Language doesn't match up with bird world, straightforwardly. You gotta be really careful, you gotta think about it, you gotta be skeptical. Uh, so that somebody like Whitman who assumes, I know what the bird means, Dickinson's like, no sir, it's in you. Uh, and that's, that's an, this is the kind of dialogue that happens between bird poems across the centuries as people talk about what interspecies encounter means, how it proceeds, what its limits are. Naturally, of course, Dickinson is writing this poem which is about whether a bird is heard or unheard, and her poem is a song, and she's writing it not for publication, but in a handwritten manuscript. Dickinson always has about 20 levels to whatever she does. I mean, she's that kind of genius. Uh, but one can read this poem as a way to, uh, as a warning about where you can go wrong uh, in talking about birdsong. And I'd like to give as a final example of a poem, uh, one that is from the 20th century. Uh, it is an example of a modernist poem that is one uh, that is, foregrounds the question of language. And this one is about an oven bird. The poem is Robert Frost's The Oven Bird from his book A Mountain Interval from 1916. And as always, Frost is repeating a lot of the gestures of the 19th century, particularly in relation to nature and animals. But he always does so starting from a standpoint of skepticism. Granted, language is not going to be that wonderful vehicle that's going to give us telepathy and tell us what birds are thinking. There is a singer everyone has heard, loud, a midsummer and a midwood bird who makes the solid tree trunks sound again. He says that leaves are old 
and that for flowers, midsummer is to spring as one to ten. He says the early petal fall is past. When pear and cherry bloom went down in showers on sunny days, a moment overcast. And comes that other fall we name the fall. He says the highway dust is over all. The bird would cease and be as other birds, but that he knows in singing not to sing. The question that he frames in all but words is what to make of a diminished thing. Now, if you're a veteran reader of poetry, one of the things you might have done is notice that this particular poem looks like a certain magic length. And if you count the number of lines, there are 14. <coughs> and then if you begin to think in terms of rhythm, it's iambic pentameter. That is, there are five stresses per line, and it has a kind of walking rhythm. Da 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 da. When pear and cherry bloom went down in showers on sunny days, a moment overcast. So, 14 lines iambic pentameter. What is it? Sonnet! Except it's not. No sonnet opens with a couplet. So it, it is a sonnet, but it isn't. The rhymes are all wrong. Everything in this poem is something, but not really. Sonnets are frequently about love. But this is a love poem for a bird. Except it's not really love, it's identification. But it's kind of depressing rather than elating. <laughs> so Frost does this to you all the time. You think you know what you're talking about, and then you dig in a little bit and you're like, wait, no. Uh, and that, that is the Frostian kind of poetics. And instead of getting spring, like we do in Dunbar, we get midsummer. It's not even fall where you can be like, Melancholy and morose. No, it's midsummer. <laughs> uh, and uh, spring has passed, but we're not to fall yet. We're somewhere in between. So we have these deflationary moments. And we get the, the, the trope of the migrant, the, 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 that we're on a pilgrimage through life, except it just happens to be hot and dusty, and we got highway dust. So everything, all these kinds of 19th century tropes and, and, and figures of speech and ways of talking are repeated and undercut. And that all leads up to this final glorious stanza where we get a bird who is not as other birds, but is. And he knows in singing not to sing. Okay, you sing by not singing, and that makes you like but not like birds. And then you frame a question in all but words. So you're, you're as if you're using language, but not. Everything is advanced and taken back, put under a bit of erasure. And then this leads to this final statement of what to make of a diminished thing. The word make, uh, Frost always puts a lot of attention on little words. What to make of a diminished thing. The word make in English language poetry is frequently significant. Maker is an old synonym for poet in English. And the word poet itself means maker in ancient Greek. So what to make of a diminished thing. And that rhymes with sing earlier. So you're a diminished song. And of course diminished is a music pun and Frost is having a lot of fun here. Uh, but the idea is that when writing about birdsong, Frost is not going to give us that full-throated warble of Whitman. He takes on board from the very beginning Dickinson's skepticism and is aware that his poetry is diminished from that height of mid kind of 19th century romantic gloriousness. Now that can sound depressing. And particularly after Jessica's introduction talking about joy, you'd think that I shouldn't be ending with diminished things. <laughs> However, what if we do need a bit of diminishment, a bit of a puncture? That one can be a little bit too superheated about the human. Humans are this, animals are that. But remember Dunbar, sometimes human animal lines have to be very carefully revisited. What if what we need is a diminished poetics that takes into account that when we write about and communicate with other species we shouldn't overstate what we understand. Maybe a new ethics, a new ethics that can be redemptive and open into a new world, begins with a little bit of modesty. This is a collage by Betty Saar, I love it, uh, because it seems to 
be an image for inspiration, the bird on the head. But it's also slightly surreal, like under what circumstances would a bird be on your head? <laughs> uh, but I, 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 this to me is, is an example of this kind of art, trying to talk about interspecies encounter. I'm giving you just a taste of what it might be like to go at these kinds of questions in other art forms. But yes, a possible global cross art form way of addressing pressing, really pressing human and non-human problems. I want to give my last word. Well, th this, is, this is the kind of polemical one. This is uh, anthropologist Anna Tsing has responded to all the definitions of human nature that are out there and said the one we need, the progressive one, is to say human nature is an interspecies relationship. Human nature means that we are always, always, always already embedded in these networks of care and reciprocity with other species. That is what it means to be human. And that might be the grounding of a new starting point. So that's my last word. But I want to give the last word, so to sing, to the Washington State bird, <laughs> the American goldfinch. And it's a flock of them. And I have no idea what they're saying. And that's a good thing. Thank you.